Good morning, everyone. While everybody gets kind of settled in a little bit, I know we got a lot of visiting going on this morning and things to talk about, but we do need to get started, and I'm running a little bit late myself. Um, while we're kind of settling in, Jeff, if you want to come on and be on your way up here, uh, he's got a, a little bit of information he's going to share with us this morning uh, from what Greg mentioned the other day regarding the uh, situation over in Ukraine and an opportunity for us as far as uh, giving is concerned uh, in that part of the world. So, Jeff, if you want to go ahead and take a minute or two. Thank you, and good morning. We're all aware of the, the crisis that's going on over in the Ukraine right now, and I know we've had many people to ask, you know, how, how we can help. And I've got with the elders, and after researching several different relief organizations, I've came up with the, uh, the Healing Hands International. It's a Church of Christ-affiliated organization. We all know that. And uh, we've looked at all this, and, of course, like, like I said, I mean, everybody's just aware of what, you know, what's going on over there, so... Here in the next couple of weeks, if if you would like to contribute to this fund, you, you can give it, you know, you can give a check or whatever to me or one of the elders. If you Venmo it, just I ask you to put uh, Ukraine relief on there that when everything's kind of gathered up. And uh, I put on there the 27th of March. I mean, that's, that's a couple of weeks. And and if anyone has any questions or anything about you, you can see me or, or one of the elders. And again, just thank you. And I just ask to... Just please let us help and make an impact over there. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And again, if anybody wishes to uh, contribute to that, uh, just see uh, Jeff or one of the uh, elders or deacons, and uh, we'll make sure we take care of that. And uh, when the time comes, we'll get that in the proper hands uh, as far as that uh, relief effort is concerned. I have a, <clears throat> a few cards this morning I'd like to uh, uh, read. Uh, the first one here is from uh, Jerry and Betty. It says, uh, I'd just like to thank you all also uh, all, uh, also very much for your prayers and love and cards and uh, from my uh, sweet sister, uh, Jean. Uh, she loved her church, family, and enjoyed the um, ladies' retreat and um, loved working and um, loved being with you all. Said, love, Jerry and Betty. Said, uh, thank you so much, too, for the good meal. Uh, you prepared for the family. It was so good. So, again, that was from uh, Jerry and Betty on behalf of Ms. Uh, Jean Whitworth. Another one here um, I'd like to go ahead and, uh, and read this morning. Um, <clears throat> said, to the elders and uh, many members of the Last Cassis Church of Christ, thank you um, so very much for your outpouring and love to our family in memory of um, our mom uh, and beautiful flowers. Uh, Things that um, were given uh, that will always be special in terms of a remembrance of the relationship uh, with you all uh, as our church family. Uh, we especially want to thank you uh, so very much and the special friends uh, that uh, visited our mother and was thoughtful for the years uh, that she was there spiritually and um, for the time that she is in Stones River. Uh, where many of you visited her before COVID set in. Uh, there were so many of you who were faithful to uh, see her and send her cards and to remember her and your prayers. May God bless all of you, Kathy and Randy and the family of Ms. Emma Jean Vault. And one more, if you'll indulge me here this morning. <clears throat> My church family. It's from Ms. Opal. Thank you so much for all the prayers, calls, texts, and the throw during a really difficult time. Sheila's journey to uh, better health was hard but successful, and now the loss of my brother, R.L., has uh, been very difficult. With your help and the strength of God's Spirit that uh, works in us, there is peace that passes knowledge. Thank you again. We are a family. Ms. Opal. Again, as we uh, <clears throat> go through everyday walks of life this week, let us uh, continue to be mindful of those who have uh, recently lost loved ones in our prayers, and um, especially those that we've mentioned this morning. As far as our announcements today go, we have uh, a few events that are coming along. First of all, we've got a new baby in our congregation, baby Woodard. So um, 
Adeline, I think I'm saying that correctly. Elaine Wooder was born to Wesley and uh, Tiffany this last week, weighs 7, uh, 7 11, and was 19 and a half inches long, and they're doing well. So I think part of that family is here with us this morning. I think I saw Wes and his dad in this morning, so good to have them with us. Um, calling all graduates, need to get that information turned in soon for that particular event. Packed pulpit, you see we've already started up here. That will uh, go on through uh, March the 23rd. And we have a baby shower today. So uh, you're all invited to attend a baby shower for Brock and Rachel Benson uh, this Sunday, March 13th from 1.30 to uh, 3 o'clock. <clears throat> They're registered at Amazon.com, baby registry. Uh, under Brock and Rachel Benson. Please come celebrate the, uh, w this wonderful occasion with them. Uh, that is actually today at 1.30, so please uh, make a point to uh, come and attend that today for uh, Brock and Rachel and their new baby and Colette's new sister or brother. I forgot to ask. Or do we know? No, no? Oh, that's unusual, but that's, that's cool. <laughs> uh, let's say um, couples book study, um, elders, deacons, ministers meeting coming up. Uh, youth group family dinner and uh, serving the Lord with gladness uh, concludes our announcements and our bulletin this morning. For more details on any of these, please take a moment to get a bulletin this morning and read through those for specific dates and times of those events and activities. This morning as we begin our call to worship, <clears throat> I'll be reading uh, a few verses here um, that... Um, I guess in the midst of everything, we usually use these verses during our Thanksgiving time, I guess, but I guess being thankful is a year-round thing, or it should be for us anyway. Uh, taken from Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verses 15, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that, you, <clears throat> so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the richness of his glorious inheritance in the holy people and this incomparably great power for us who believe. This is a, an appropriate prayer, I think, for them at this particular point in time, as well as us, as far as praying for our brethren. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer, please. Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for all your many blessings. We thank you, Heavenly Father, today for our health and our well-being. We pray, Heavenly Father, you continue to watch over us uh, through uh, the difficult times that our family here has experienced recently, as well as the joyous times which we have experienced here again recently. Uh, with the birth of a new baby and another one on the way within our congregation. We continue to pray for these families, Heavenly Father, uh, in each regard. We pray this morning, too, for TJ. Uh, we pray that you continue to watch over him and uh, give him comfort and Miss Flora May strength uh, during this very difficult time. Uh, we just ask uh, your blessings upon them, uh, Lord, for uh, we know uh, that uh, they need it right now. And uh, we need to be ever mindful of that in our everyday prayers uh, that uh, we lift and continue to lift them up to you. Lord, as we begin our uh, worship service this morning, we ask that you uh, clear our minds and our hearts of worldly things, that we may be open to the scriptures that will be revealed to us this morning in the lesson, that we may be able to take uh, these thoughts and words and apply them to everyday walks of life, but most importantly, Heavenly Father, that it will equip us to be able to spread the gospel as we are commanded to do in the scriptures. Uh, we pray for strength. Uh, we pray for the ability to not be embarrassed uh, by approaching individuals regarding uh, making them aware of Jesus. And we just pray that you would uh, strengthen us when opportunities arise to uh, do these things. And uh, remember always, Heavenly Father, that uh, the glory is always intended for you and not for us. We'd ask you now, Heavenly Father, to forgive us, to watch over us, to continue to be with us. All these things we ask in Jesus Christ. Amen. Morning. 
Please join with me this morning as we begin. Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms above. While the light from the throne shines for you and me, let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the While we tarry below, there is work to do, and our strength cometh from above. As we labor and wait, we must all be true. Let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call. to the 
If you'd be returning with me to John chapter 10 this morning. A few thoughts um, before we partake of the Lord's Supper, um, specifically the bread at this time. And we often think about different things. Or we, we strive to focus on at this point in time of our service um, the bread of life and the fruit of the vine. I kind of want you to think this morning about how the, the Lord's Supper challenges your desire. In John chapter 10, picking up with verse 17. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. You know, in John chapter 10 here, um, we really see clearly that Jesus gave his life up for us. It wasn't taken from him. It was something he willingly did. And when you throw in Mark 8, 34 and John 3, 14, throughout the course of Jesus' early life, he knew that he was going to die. He knew that he would die, or I'm sorry, the manner in which he would die. And all of that he did out of his love for us. And he also knew about a Last Supper. In Luke chapter 22, you look at verse 15. Jesus uses this phrase, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Again, Jesus said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover meal with you. I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus knew what awaited him when he took on this earthly flesh. And he lived the life knowing what awaited for him. And as that moment approached, it's not something he necessarily feared. In preparation for that, that, that Lord's Supper that we kind of partake in now, he uses that term, he earnestly desires to do this. And one may ask, why? How do you have Jesus, knowing what's about to happen very shortly, the pain, the humiliation, and the suffering that was about to occur to him, how could he sit there and earnestly want to participate in this meal. He desired that because he knew that would be the last God-ordained Passover and it would be the first God-ordained Lord's Supper. He was also looking forward to something that was future hence. When he got to partake of that meal again at that great banquet after Judgment Day. Jesus was able to look past the pain and the suffering that's tied to this world and look to something greater, something that's more joyous, something that's more rewarding. Jesus challenges our desire. We should remember that at this point in time, Jesus is preparing a place for us. Do you desire to be with him? As we reflect at this point in time on this bread, Really think about, where is your heart? In your daily walk, are you desiring to one day be with Jesus? Let us pray. Almighty Father, we're thankful to be here this morning. At this point in time, to come together as the church and partake of this bread. Father, we reflect on the life of Jesus Christ that he willingly gave for us. We check our desire at this time. Are we truly seeking to be reunited with Jesus? as he is away, as, as he is preparing a place for us to one day walk into with him. Is that, what we want, is that where we want to be? Jesus is the bread of life. And our partaking of this helps us to focus on that, to remember what we were given that day when he offered himself. Father, we offer this prayer through you in his holy name. Amen.
Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy Let me turn into Hebrews chapter 10, and I'll, I'll be there in a moment. I thought about it, the Lord's Supper challenges your desires. It also confirms your dependence. In Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. You know, it was that reminder. Jesus was flesh, and Jesus understood the fallibility of man and the short-term memories that we often carry with us. And so he issues this to them, to do this in remembrance of me. He instituted that to be a constant reminder that we are to remember him. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 through 14, we see how we depend on Christ for our salvation. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins... He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Jesus on the cross, by giving up his life, his body, and by the shedding of his blood, completely satisfied the requirement he opened up the gates for us to one day enter through. Each time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are confirming our dependence on him as the one and only way to which we have salvation, and that is through him. Let us pray. Almighty Father, we're so grateful to have a, a living God who loves us, one who's willing to overlook our sins and offer us a means of salvation. And that comes through Jesus Christ. We are dependent on him for that. And as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we focus on that dependence, on the power of Jesus' blood for the atonement of sins it provides. We pray this morning that we partake of this in a manner that confirms our dependence on Jesus. And we pray this through his name. Amen.
Good morning. Hope everyone is doing well. It's been kind of a strange week. Uh, for those of you that work outside like some of us do, which I don't work much, but I was outside, uh, we went from shorts and T-shirts to jackets on Friday night. Blake, you probably know this, but the wind was probably howling up on y'all as a figure of speech um, <laughs> on Friday. <laughs> so, so uh, and, then, and then you lose an hour of sleep, and then you find out that Sunday school, Sunday school is, is uh, canceled, and some of you came, and some of you were late, and some of you are still trying to get here. But anyway, it is a, it's a, a fascinating day, but it's a good day to be together, to stir each other up, to love and good works. And this morning, as we begin, we'll go through some, um, some memory verses. Did we decide whether y'all were coming up this morning, Braden? Did we decide whether y'all were coming up here with me? Okay, they're, they're going to stay seated. So we're going to go with Psalms 19, 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We'll go to Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable. That was pretty good. And then we're going to do the one up here on the uh, screen, Mark 16, 15, 16, which I know you know it, so we'll just take it off. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Sound it good. You, you carry this. If you have your Bibles, our text is going to start over in John chapter 5 this morning. And uh, we're going to work our way over to John chapter 8. Adam's already been in John chapter 10 this morning, so appreciate that. Jesus is in the third year of his ministry. He has healed the lame man at the pool of Bethsaida. He's been lame for like 38 years, and he performs a miracle in which he can walk. But he does it on the Sabbath day. Because he does it on the Sabbath day, the Pharisees have said he has violated the law, and they basically want him dead because of that. He'll go from there, he'll feed the 5,000, and he'll feed the 5,000 on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. After he gets through feeding them, he goes up into the mountain to pray, and then in the evening time, he's going to walk across the Sea of Galilee to go to Capernaum. And the apostles have a boat, of course they encounter him walking on the water, and they're afraid, but... He gets on board the boat and works his way back over to Capernaum. The word gets out to the 5,000, and they make their way by boat and around the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee to go see Jesus. They find Jesus, and he begins to speak to them. But in the meantime, Jesus is starting to see that a lot of people are coming to see him because they get fed and because he heals and he's going to make a statement that's going to be a hard saying. He's going to say to that group of people and to his disciples that unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you can't have everlasting life. And that's pretty tough saying for a lot of those followers that have been following him not for the spiritual food but for the physical Food. And he loses a lot of followers with that. He goes to his own disciples and says, what do you think about that? And it was a hard saying. And because of that, it kind of called a lot of people out at that point, the ones that followed him for food and followed him to be healed. He's going to make his way into Jerusalem, and there's going to be the Feast of Tabernacles that's going to take place. The Feast of Tabernacles is... The celebration that lasted for seven days in which it was a celebration of harvest. 
It was a celebration of God's deliverance of the Israelites during the wilderness wandering. And during that seven-day celebration, uh, they built the, the people in Jerusalem, the Jews in Jerusalem, built for themselves houses out of branches from fruit trees and palm trees. And they lived in these uh, for the seven days, symbolizing them being in the wilderness for that amount of time. And then the, the celebration that happens toward the end of that seven-day feast. And it's a very joyous feast. Jesus, though, doesn't attend that. He goes uh, to the temple and he begins to teach in the temple there. And it's, the Bible talks about on the last day of the great feast, he makes his way to the feast. And if you have your Bible, turn over to John chapter 7. And we'll pick up with verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And as he has been teaching, and as they hear these things, the people are kind of divided over who he is, and is he a prophet? What's kind of going on with that? And then you still have the Pharisees who want to entrap him for that. And that's going to lead us to our story, which happens in chapter 8. After the feast, he's going to end up the next day at the temple area, and he's going to be teaching there in the court of the Gentiles. And let's pick up with chapter 8, verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives... But early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, he said, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So Jesus is there in the court of the Gentiles, and he's teaching, and the, and the Pharisees, they want to entrap Jesus, so they have, they have brought this woman who is caught in the very act of adultery. And they come to, her, come to, to Jesus and say, he, she's caught in the very act of adultery. What do you say about this? There's a little dilemma here because if he says she should not be stoned, then they'll say, well, you violated the law of Moses. If he says, well, let's stone her, then they would say to him, we're going to carry you to Pilate because only the Romans can uh, have uh, punishment, capital punishment. And you can't, you can't do that. So the Bible talks about that as they're talking, Jesus stoops down and he starts to write something on the ground. And there's been a lot of thought process from different people about what he writes on the ground. She was caught in the very act of adultery, right? Where was the man? If she was caught in the very act of adultery, then where was the man? Somehow the man, he's he's not there. So maybe he writes down the actual law that comes from Leviticus 20 and 10 and Deuteronomy 22, 22. And it says this, The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, 
He who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. So maybe he's writing down, this is the law. You only brought the woman. What did you do with the man? Or some people have speculated that what Jesus did was as he stooped down with those Pharisees and those scribes and, and those that had come along, that had tagged along with them for the spectacle, started to write their name down and maybe their sin. Wouldn't that be something? You know, we all have kind of these sins that we kind of hide right here that we, want, we don't want anybody to know about, you know, but all of a sudden he's writing them on the ground. And he gets up after listening to all this and he says, he who is without sin, you cast the first stone. Goes back down, he starts to write on the ground again and the Bible says, each one convicted in their heart from the oldest to the last they leave. And Jesus gets up and he looks around and he says to the woman, where, where are those that condemn you? And she says, well, they've gone. So I don't condemn you either, but go and sin no more. And a lot of us are familiar with this opening. So this morning I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that happened there. And one of the things is, let's go over to Matthew chapter 7 for just a minute. We need to be careful how we look at other sins. And Jesus is going to make this statement in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to pick up verses 1 through 5. He says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove this speck out of your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. Luke 18. Luke 18. And we're going to pick up with verse 9. Jesus speaking a parable. And he also spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector, I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. But the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be abased, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You have to be careful, and especially as believers, we have to be careful how we judge others. And Jesus talked about this specifically because he had healed the lame man who had been lame for 38 years and got a chance to walk on the Sabbath. Then the Pharisees came to him and said, you've committed sin because you've healed him on the Sabbath. Listen to what Jesus says in chapter 7. He's going to respond to them as they condemn him for the healing that he did on the Sabbath. And we're going to pick up with verse 20 of chapter 7. The people answered what Jesus was talking about. And he said, you have a demon. 
who was seeking to kill you. And Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath day. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. You've got to judge looking through the lens of God. You have to, you have to judge through the Word that Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 when there was a man sleeping with his stepmother inside the assembly. He says, you don't, you don't necessarily judge those on the outside, but you make sure you judge those on the inside, but you do that with a righteous judgment. You do that not trying to take the plank out of somebody, out of a speck out of somebody else's eye with a plank in your own eye. And a lot of this is the Pharisees would sit there and condemn what Jesus was doing, and Jesus to them will, will say several times, he says, you know, what will happen is you condemn me for healing a man on the Sabbath, but if you're, any of your livestock needs to be watered on the Sabbath, you will take a halter and you will put it on them and you will take them and lead them to water. If you have your ox that is caught in a the ditch, then you'll stop and you'll go do that. He says, you're a bunch of hypocrites. Greg Walter had brought up to me several years ago this lesson. He said, you need this lesson topic. Your sins are my indiscretions. Your sins are my... Now, let that sink in just for a minute. Let's just say that again. Your sins are my indiscretions. That's the Pharisees. Oh, look. There's, there's, there's that man that says he's from God. He should know the law. He's healing on the Sabbath. Sin. But if your horse needs to be watered or your cow needs to be watered or the ox needs to come out of the ditch, well, that's fine because your sins are my indiscretions. That's funny how that works, isn't it? You know, we hear something. And it's maybe something we've kind of done before. Or maybe we do that in secret or whatever it might be. And we're, we're the first to call our close... Because we have our little cliquish friends that we kind of get with. We all, we're all guilty of having our close amount of friends around us. And as soon as we hear something about somebody, you know, let me get on the phone. Did you hear what happened? You know, that's... that's uh, Let's put it on Facebook. Let's, let's go talk to the elders about it. Did you hear about all that? Your sins are my indiscretions. Now, let the tables turn, and somebody starts calling about you or talking about you. You're like, oh, now, let's don't do that. Let's don't, let's don't, let's don't do that because your sins are my indiscretions. What makes us like that? I think it's human nature to a certain point, don't it? Well, it, it isn't it? I shouldn't say that. My mother, my mother would get on me for my improper use of English. And so would Adam at that point. A lot of times when we're doing something kind of secretly or we have a little bit of problem with it, when we find out that somebody else is doing that, it kind of makes me feel good, doesn't it? Well, I, you know, maybe what I'm doing is not quite so bad. So then I, I you know, I want to just reach out. And I just want, uh, uh. I like to get on them about that, even though I do that. There's in that some self-righteousness to a point about that because, you know, I, your sins are my indiscretions. There's, there's this problem of that if I have something in my life that I'm not really dealing with as I should be, it makes me feel better to have to get on somebody else about it. So we, have, we need to be careful 
we need to be careful how we judge the accusations that we make because a lot of times those things kind of point back to us. And, you know, and we need to be really careful as I, as I bring this lesson up, as I talk about this, we got to be really careful. We need to teach our children especially as we, as we measure. A lot of times we, we look at people around us and we kind of measure ourselves, you know. And we, we, we kind of say, well, that person did this, that person did that, that person does this, and I'm, I'm just like a quarter inch above that, and I feel pretty good about me. And that's not the measuring stick we ought to be using. What's our measuring stick? Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, starts with this. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not count it robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation, taking on the form of a servant and coming in the appearance of a man. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to death, even the death on the cross. So God has highly exalted him that in his, his name every knee should bow, those in heaven, those on earth, and those below the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul says now, as, as, you, all, have, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, for it is God that works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. The mind that we are to take on is one of submission, is one of obedience, it's, it's one of humbleness, and it's one of love. Paul talks about it in, in, when he talks about love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love does not rejoice in wrong. It should hurt us when our brothers and sisters in Christ make mistakes. It should hurt us in the way that we handle it if we handle it improperly. Go to Galatians chapter 6 for just a moment. Galatians chapter 6. Paul kind of dealing with this aspect of sin in our lives. And we'll pick up with verse 1. He says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Verse 2, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Verse 4, but let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. When sin enters our camp, we want to confront that with gentleness. We want to we confront that with love. We want to look at, we want to look at our, own, our own lives. And if there, if there are things that we're doing in our lives that are not correct, then we confess our sins one to another, those things should be healed. There's a whole, there's a whole other mindset there, see. We don't, we don't walk around with this idea that your sins are my indiscretions. It is, I'm, I'm concerned for the body. We're here to stir each other up to love and good works. Anything that you're struggling with, I want to help you with because probably I'm struggling with just as much. I'm, I'm struggling with just as much. And we need to be considerate of how we handle it. Listen, listen be, you restore a man in gentleness, considering also that you could be tempted. And it's very true. So as we think about the story today of the woman called in adultery, is we need to know, first of all, that our God is a forgiving God for each one of us that are believers. And we sin. We make mistakes. As the body of Christ, we want to be considerate of each other. We are the body. We're fitly framed and knit together. We're working together. 
so we can spend eternity together. And let's, let's be conscious of the fact that I know there's going to be sin in your life. There's going to be sin in my life. If I hear about that, what, am I, what do I want to do? I want to go to you because I love you. And plus, I know that I've got some things in my life that are not all together as they should be. So I encourage you as you're around brothers and sisters that are committing a sin, that we also look at our own lives and say, what is that that controls us? As much trouble as I have with that, let me help you with what you're involved in. Go to 1 John just for a moment. Let's pick up with verse 5. Let's pick up with verse 4. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full or complete. This is the message which we heard from him and declared to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as... He is in the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen to verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin, and if anyone sins... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Jesus came for us. He came for us as sinners. When we become believers, when we go down the water grave of baptism and our sins are washed away and we come out in Christ, our goal is to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus daily. Our, our goal is not to sin. That is our goal. But brothers and sisters in Christ, we are going to make mistakes. And I challenge you this morning as we make mistakes that we are conscious of the fact that we all, as John talks about, we've all sinned. And when those brothers and sisters in Christ that we have that are dear to us, when they make mistakes, let's approach that with gentleness, let's approach that with love, and let's work together to make the body stronger and better. And let's realize that it could be us. We, we, each day, we all make decisions every day. Some are good, some are bad. Some of us find ourselves in compromising positions, uh, positions and we make bad decisions. If we confess our sins one to another, we shall be healed. But listen to the rest of that. When Jesus was there with the woman, and he got up and he looked around and he said, Woman, where are your accusers? So they're gone. He says, well, I don't condemn you either, but go and sin no more. That's what the Lord asks of you. You're going to make mistakes, and the blood of Jesus Christ is going to cleanse you if you want it cleansed. But your goal is, once that happens, is I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to do it anymore. And that is the part of denying yourself and taking up your cross and following him, and this is the beauty of the body in which you are part of. We don't condemn each other. We help each other. We edify each other, and we build each other up. So I, I, I challenge you for each one of us to realize with our weakness and the things that we battle every day, other people battle things also. And let us work together as a unit. 
Let us work together to be gentle in our forgiving spirit of each one another and look forward to the time that we can spend eternity together. This morning, do you find yourself with that attitude? Or, of, you know, your sins are my indiscretions this morning. I want to pray for you. And I want to pray for each one of us that we are stronger, that we are light, that we are salt, that we're better, better examples for each other, that we build each other up. And if there's, if there's something on your mind that we need to pray about this morning, then there's no more appropriate time. Mark, are you ready? He's ready. So we ask you to come while together we stand and sing. Hearken the loving call, obey. Come for he loves you so. Only a step, only a step. Come for he bled for you. time, please uh, pass your attendance cards to the center aisle. And if there's nothing else this morning, we will close with I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and so shall I be saved from my and I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Jesus Christ, who died for me. And he took away my sin, and I will live with him for eternity. 
And I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, let the God of my salvation be exalted. I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Dear Lord, thank you once again for letting us be able to come and worship you today. We ask that you be with us as we leave and keep us safe. Lord, we ask that you bless this congregation and, and help us to uh, keep each one, one another accountable in a loving way. And Lord, we ask that you be with all of the ones on the sick, be with all the sick, and, and be with everyone who needs your healing. And Lord, we, we thank you for all the young ones who are being born, and we thank you for the blessings that they give to this congregation. We ask that you be with all the members and everyone else who is overseas serving for our country and bless them and keep them safe and bring them back. Lord, we <clears throat> thank you for sending your son to die on the cross to give us our sins, and it's in his son's and your son's name that I pray. Amen.